Hey guys and gals, Nery here for Drake Wing Gaming. It's something new man, sort of the gaming drag today. I'm coming back at you another Let's Play episode of Minotaur Hotel. Alright, y'all, let's go ahead and jump right back into it, shall we? Let's see where we're we? Warm chain, you are up, and let's go. Alright. <clears throat> After checking on your teams, you head to the lounge for dinner. Tonight's dinner isn't noteworthy. After all, Luke spent the day busy with other tasks, but everyone seems to be enjoying the night. The guests that worked on the internet project surround Asterion. They all seem to have grown quite familiar with each other over the whole ordeal. <clears throat> he smiles and laughs with their jokes, and even plays along most of the time, but more often than not his gaze drifts away just as his ears droop. Midway through the meal, Asterion excuses himself and bids everyone a good night. Just before leaving, he looks at you and nods. After finishing your meal and enjoying some time with the guests, you get up to return to your quarters. However, as you walk towards the stairs, something catches your attention. Just further ahead, coming from outside the hotel, there's the plucking of strings. No melody ties these idle notes together, and each one hangs in the air until it silences itself. There's a sharp-edged twine preceding each note, as if whoever played it had forced the string and let it out in agony. You follow the sound and open the door. <coughs> the Minotaur's ears flick to catch your footsteps and the doors groan, but a stare remains aimed at the stars. His middle finger caresses a string, then pulls it as it rolls on his skin. The Minotaur lets it hook on his nail and keeps pulling, forcing the string out as his hand hardens and con hardens and contracts into a claw. He plucks the lyre's string. He plucks the lyre's string with that same sharpness and cringes as he lets it go. A grunt escapes his throat and his tail thrashes. He lays a hand over the strings, ceasing the dying hum, and lets his head hang. Good evening, my lord. Good evening, Asterion. Enjoying some fresh air? Yes, I needed to do some thinking and rehearsing something the matter? The Minotaur hunches over his lyre, readjusting his hands upon it, trying to find a position that doesn't feel so awkward. His forearm twitches as he sucks air and until his back expands, then lets it out through his mouth. I suppose it all became too much today. So many things have been happening all at once. Good things, but it's so much. It all bounced around in my head. All the people, all the tasks, the valley expedition too. So I came here to think... Oh, if you want, I can go back and let you have your privacy. Sorry to interrupt. No, if you have a minute to spare, I would like to bring a matter to your attention. Sure, go on. It's just... you don't have to do this. What do you mean? You don't have to... you shouldn't help me. Going out to the valley yourself, dedicating your time and getting in harm's way from me. I will heal on my own, given enough time. Are you saying this because the expedition might interfere with the internet research? You don't have to worry about that. Now that we are split into teams, it's manageable. That's not it. His f he fingers the liar's strings, letting out an aimless hum of notes. I am afraid you'll be disappointed after this is all done. The Minotaur looks down and brings his legs together to support the weight of the liar, and then raises both hands to scratch a claw at the back of his skull. The fur at the back of his neck stands up as he keeps scratching, digging in with such a ferocity you would not be surprised to see tufts of hair coming out. Coffee time. <sighs> All the while he mumbles and grunts under his breath, searching for words that will not come. I'm afraid, I'm afraid I don't get what you mean. Sometimes it just becomes too much to me. Even if I enjoy the company, all the life, I can't stop myself from wishing everything would stop. Well, you were locked away for a long time. It's no wonder it becomes overwhelming for you. After all, after all those years in, si in a silent, dark room. <sighs> it was still like that before that happened. My stomach twists and turns. Fire crawls up to the back of my throat, and this dull nausea makes me hunch over. It feels like the whole world is about to fall apart any moment. I just want it to stop. He hugs his lyre. When he tries talking again, the words get stuck in his throat. He hunches over to spit them out, but all that comes out is another groan. You don't seem too well. You might be having an anxiety attack, or perhaps you're panicking. I know you've been through a lot, and I can't see my words doing much to reassure you. I mean, how much do, do words mean? But I'll say it. I'll do everything in my power to make the hotel fulfill its mission. Nothing bad will happen to you. The Minotaur's back straightens, and his tail jerks along with his ears. He looks again to the stars, holding his instrument, just as a breeze passes by to send chills up your spine. Hysterion snorts, shakes himself, and for a moment it would seem as if... It were as if a reinvigorated spirit is taking over. His voice, however, tells another story. He speaks again, it comes out dulled, sluggish, with each syllable deliberately enunciated. This liar, my lord, 
It does not look old, does it? Its string will always give out such lively notes, so easy to weave into a delightful tune. One by one, all of Asterion's anxious quirks, the hair standing up at the back of his neck, his hooves scraping against the ground, the fingers flickering over the strings. They, are, they all silence themselves. In its place is another being, which, a bit pacified, seems despondent in a whole new cold, controlled way. And yet this lyre is older than any country back in the world of the living. I've played it ever since I was a kid. When my father sent me to the labyrinth, I didn't get to take much with me. He thought it would be distracting, but a guard sneaked it in for me. It's so odd to me. For over a century, I tried learning how to use cutlery, and as you could see, I never succeeded. But it wasn't so when I was a child. I could learn anything back then. How to carve wood, shoot arrows, play this old, friendly lyre. It helps me think. It drowns out everything else. Even just tuning it feels like it puts everything else in order. My old friend. Would you like to take a seat with me tonight? As turbulent as my mind may be, a little audience would be... Uh, I would enjoy your company. Oh. Chapter 12. The concert? Okay, I guess we're holding a benefit concert. We're going to invite Meatloaf. When you wake up the next morning, you feel the burn before you even get up. Your legs haven't even felt this sore in a while. You stretch your whole body, and that same soreness extends up to your back, but it's satisfying in its own way. Yesterday's expedition to the, val expedition to the valley was a long hike, quite the welcome change of pace from all these days inside the hotel. Plus, you got a lot done in one day. When you look at the clock, you find it's already quite a bit later than your usual waking time. Uh, after everything, you have, you have earned a late start to the day. Breakfast must be quick to account for it, however. While Starian makes scrambled eggs, you go behind his back and prepare toast. And he puts the plate on the table and motions to prepare something else, so you surprise him by making a sandwich with toast and eggs. Oh, is that not a tad humble for the realm's lord? Maybe, but it's already late. What do you say we sit together and share a sandwich while we play the day? While we plan the day. Oh, I'd rather not repeat the other day's disaster, if you wouldn't mind. Well, wasn't it cutlery the issue? And we are eating sandwiches today, after all. I'm sure Luke would throw a fit if he learned we were eating this, or were eating this with forks and knives. Hmm. I suppose there's no arguing against that. Before I sit down, is my clothing appropriate for the day? Let's see. Uh, I'll do a modern shirt. There we go. Yeah, boy. Hello. There we go. Yes. Asterion inspects his clothing and general appearances while you eat. Uh, y'all, does is it, uh, does it, uh, is anyone in the comments, can you tell me if it is, like, there's any kind of negative consequence for changing his fur color? I'm just, I'm just interested. If, if you have to keep his fur color the same, otherwise you incur, like, a penalty with him or something. Anyway, y'all, just let me know in the comments, anyway. Thank you for your selection. Today might be an important day after all. If we get the bottle? If we get the bottle, yes. I must remind you that I can still heal without it. Our priority should be getting the internet up and running so as to not upset the guests. Based on how you describe it, and how much I hear about it in the lounge, it seems to be essential to you all now. It would be a tragedy if we were to lose guests over this issue. It's annoying to live without it, sure, but I'd say we're doing a good job managing the hotel otherwise. We're facing a lot of challenges and doing our best. It speaks for itself. I doubt people would stop coming here over lack of internet. Besides, we could still, I hope, make it get both done by tonight. You take a bite of your egg sandwich. You sound optimistic, Master. We'll see. I hope Luke and Coder are more cooperative today. Second you know, coffee time. Oh man. Some damn good coffee. You finish your breakfast in silence, together without any catastrophic cutlery situation. After cleaning the table of any breadcrumbs, you and Asterian walk towards the staircase together before splitting up. You head to reception while Asterian summons the others. Bit by bit, Luke places each piece on the tray. He looks at it from the right, then the left, before finally taking a few steps back to see how it looks from a distance. Under any other circumstance, he wouldn't care about presentation. Flavors should speak for themselves, he believes, but today, there's no margin for error. It has to taste and look right. A few decades ago, Luke had a friend to whom all this was second nature. His buddy was a chef whose pillow talk often revolved around exquisite dishes, artful plating, and the like. 
The Griffin's memories were a true enough guide. It took only a few minor adjustments after his initial attempt to get up to get it up to snuff. Luke walks out to the bar, tray in hand, and places it behind the counter. He checks the clock on the wall. Five to eight in the morning. Although the lounge was empty, Luke preferred having the lights and music on while he did his cooking. It made the place feel alive, bustling with people. But it'll get in the way, he thinks, so he shuts them off and sits in silence. Good morning. Hello. Coda walks over to the bar, inspects a stool, then another before sitting on the first. Luke twiddles his thumbs behind the bar. He chastises himself for not having a rag on hand to which he could clean the counter, if only so that he might have an excuse to avoid talking to Coda for a few more minutes. He looks to the side, searching to no avail. Even if he knows he left it back at the kitchen, he cherishes the last few seconds before he must face the dragon's scrutiny once more. Meanwhile, Coda straightens his kimono and looks around the room, then to the clock, before laying his gaze on Luke. Good to see you arrived early today. Griffin searches the dragon's face for a change of sarcasm or malice. He finds himself wanting it, that edge, even if a more conscious chunk of his mind wants to do the right thing. Oh, come on, Luke, don't. He's seriously taking a pot shot right now. No, I hope it didn't come across as such. Instead of retorting, Luke pulls out the tray he was keeping behind the counter and sets it in front of the dragon. It's a little early, but I thought you might be hungry. Coda looks at his meal with surprise, an enormous pyramid of sushi rolls with a variety of sauces and condiments to the side. Oh, wow, okay. That might get his attention. It was too much for breakfast, too much for any meal. Uh, the salmon ones on the left came out terrific. I suggest you start with those. Coda looks around the mountain of food for chopsticks, but all he sees is a cup, a cup off to the side with forks and knives. The mug itself has Live, Laugh, Love printed on it and a gaudy, gaudy, gaudy curlicue typeface, although Luke clawed it off and wrote traditional American cooking on it. <laughs> Struggling against every fiber of his being, he grabs it and, following the Griffin's suggestion, pinches one of the rolls on the left and bring it, brings it up to his mouth. It tastes nothing like the sushi he's used to. In fact, Coda is sure he can feel some seasoning between the algae and the rice that has no business being in sushi. But somehow it is not bad. Hmm, I appreciate the gesture. If you like those, wait until you try my burgers. You missed out on some really good ones though the other day. If only you hadn't acted like a dick. I think my attitude was justified. You made a terrible introduction with your garish outfit and rude behavior. Alright, I'll give you that. It wasn't the best of impressions. I noticed some of the new guests didn't appreciate it either, and I kept my ass out of reception the rest of the day. I learned my lesson. I don't want to fuck things up for anyone else. Asterian and Lexia is most of all. Coda reaches out for another roll. Yes, indeed. I'm thinking no. Yes, indeed. I will admit, I do find your devotion to Mr. Asterian and Mr. Alexios admirable. And this bar... It is not as mismanaged as I imagined. Perhaps I misjudged you. To Coda's dismay, Luke grabs a piece on the top of the pile, dips it in ketchup, and swallows it whole. I hope you don't mind. There's plenty there for the both of us. Normally, Coda would indeed mind, but today is a peculiar day already. Might as well go all, might as well go all the way. The dragon grabs another piece from the edge of the tray, the one furthest from the, ke from the bowl of ketchup. I think that's what matters, you know. The internet shit, and the expedition to the valley, all that stuff. We'll get in the way if we keep acting like assholes. That is true. Both men keep eating in silence. As more of the food gives way to the silver bottom of the tray, Coda's posture becomes less rigid and Luke's expression loosens up. Both look at each other, smile, and chat. Coda agrees to try out Luke's burgers next time, and the Griffin is enraptured by the dragon's stories about an exotic condiment known as soy sauce. What the fuck? You don't know what soy sauce is? You go to gas stations all the time. They have to have soy sauce there. Ah, Luke, you... Fucking bizarre creature. Jesus. All right. All right, y'all. I'm going to go ahead and uh, pause it right there. Thank y'all so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, ring that notification bell, and check out our Patreon if you can. It always helps. Before I go, I'm going to give a quick shout out to our lovely bronze tier patrons. Thank y'all for all you do for the channel. We greatly appreciate your support. Thank you to our silver tier patron, Cage Silvermoon. Thank you for going a bit above and beyond. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you to our gold tier patron. Oh, sorry, y'all. No gold tier patrons right now. No gold tier patrons right now, but the spot is open, and if you sign up for being a gold tier patron, you will get a custom-made avatar, or avi portrait, by L. And, uh, they're pretty awesome looking, so, yeah. you want to get a nice little, I guess, a little commission picture by signing up for our gold patron? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Probably a lot cheaper than getting an avatar done by a lot of other artists. <laughs> 
Anyway, I love you all, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye-bye!